uh, we'll see how it works out. Um, we're going to uh, yeah, be looking at Matthew chapter 3. We're in Matthew 3. Uh, we've been going through the series in Matthew. And um, what have we learned so far? Well, two principles that we've learned right from the start of Matthew is uh, this is not a story. That's the first thing. This is not a story. Matthew doesn't start with this vague once upon a time. Instead, he gives us the family tree of Jesus. He establishes when things are happening, where they're happening, who's involved. He gives us facts, not fiction. Uh, so it's not a story. It's more like a documentary about Jesus Christ telling us uh, the truth. But it's not a story, and it's not the beginning. Uh, even though we start at Matthew chapter 1, uh, it's not the start of God's plan. Matthew makes that clear by beginning with saying Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the one who has inherited promises made many centuries ago. And throughout Matthew, we'll see again and again, Matthew quotes words from the Old Testament written centuries before to say Jesus is fulfilling the promises God made many, many years ago. This is not a story and it's not the beginning. There's a plan that's being unfolded to us. So last time uh, we looked at John the Baptist and uh, we see he has this role of making this announcement. Uh, verse 2, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew then says, uh, John is the one that Isaiah spoke of hundreds of years ago, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So he's saying, clear the path for Jesus. Uh, a bit like when you're driving and you hear a siren behind you and you pull over. You know, actually, I've got to get out of the way. And when we looked at Isaiah, we realized uh, Isaiah was speaking about God coming to bring the Israelites at that point out of exile back to their home, back to their homeland. And Matthew is telling us Jesus is the one who is coming to end our exile from God and to take us into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Jesus is the promised king who will lead his people into the kingdom of heaven. The king who never fails and always lives, the only suitable king for an eternally stable kingdom. John then is baptizing people, and we thought about what baptism meant, and we realized baptism signifies the end of one identity into the water and the beginning of another identity. In the Old Testament, the Jews understood that washing the body was symbolic of cleansing the body, particularly for priests who had handled the, the sin offering. It cleansed them. Uh, but we also looked at historical evidence that if someone at the time of Jesus, if uh, someone who wasn't a Jew wanted to become a Jew, part of that process meant being immersed in water. And so uh, John doesn't just appear and create the idea of immersing people in water. We see this history of it. And people understood it meant conversion, repentance, leaving one identity behind and embracing a new identity. And John is telling the people this is one of the ways to prepare for citizenship of the kingdom. This is one of the ways to make a path for the Lord and to be ready for his arrival, to leave behind one identity and embrace a new one. John tells us in chapter 3 verse 8, there'll be fruit of this repentance, this turning around. And we saw some of the uh, evidence will be therefore love and concern for the needs of others, uh, a, an emphasis on mercy and justice. John says, uh, it's not religious adherence uh, that is simply the fruit of this, this repentance. Uh, even though us meeting together every Sunday is part of us being a church, it's, it is a fruit of repentance, us expressing that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. John then anticipates the greatness of this king. He says, I'm not worthy to carry his shoes. We thought about the building site. On the building site, you know how important someone is based on what they carry. The guy in charge carries the clipboard. Uh, the skilled laborer is carrying the tools. Uh, the guy at the bottom of the ladder, the apprentice, is carrying the tray of tea and coffee, isn't he? He's carrying, picking up all the dirty mugs and doing all that. And you can imagine the skilled laborer saying to the apprentice or the the new employee, can you go and fetch my boots from the van? I, I, I've forgotten, the, I was wearing the wrong, wrong footwear. And you can tell by what someone's carrying where they are. 
in that, that value system. And John says, I'm beneath that guy who carries the boots. Uh, I'm not even on his level. I'm right at the bottom of the ladder. In fact, I'm not at the bottom of the ladder. I'm in the gutter. That's where John saw himself, right down there. That's how, that's how my value is when I think of how great this new king is. And John anticipates something new. He anticipates the arrival of this king is going to make a difference. And he talks about the difference it makes to baptism. He says, verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but there's one coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John says, my baptism, the baptism I offer, is like a picture of change. It's like a metaphor for the, for the new identity that's being embraced. But Jesus is going to bring about something literal, a literal spiritual change. A new life. And John says, uh, through Jesus, we're going to come into this kingdom. Uh, and Jesus, in a sense, he says, he's going to gather the wheat into the barn. The chaff, those who reject Jesus, will go onto the fire. But those who embrace Jesus and submit to him as their Lord, their King, are gathered into the barn. They come into this kingdom and into the family of God. So that was last week's sermon. Uh, I took a lot longer over it than that. Uh, but uh, that's a summary. Now what do we find? What do we find? Well, we find the public ministry of Jesus is about to begin. Jesus came from Galilee, verse 13, to the Jordan, to John, to be baptised by him. This is his first significant public appearance uh, before a huge crowd of people. How was he known before that? Well, we, we're told in chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 23. He went and lived in Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. That's, that's what Jesus was known as uh, prior to this time. If you want to understand what it means to be called a Nazarene, uh, imagine you're on a training day. Okay, imagine you're in your job, you're on a training day, you sat around with a load of people and they break the ice by saying, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. And the first person says, uh, well, I am from New York. And everyone goes, wow, New York. And then the next person says, I'm here from Tokyo. And you're like, wow, that's, that's fascinating, Tokyo, brilliant. And then you say, well, I'm from Welshpool. And everybody goes, Welshpool, where's that? And that's kind of what it means for Jesus to be called a Nazarene. Uh, it's like he's from Welshpool. You know, it's, it's a great place, isn't it? But, <laughs> but you would think the king's coming, he's going to be from London, or he's going to be from New York, and actually he's a Nazarene. So his birth, you know, where he grew up, doesn't give him a big status. He's not an important person in the public sphere of things. However, remember, John knows things about Jesus that nobody else knows. Uh, we've already seen previously that John was a relative of Jesus. His mum, Elizabeth, was a relative of Jesus' mum, Mary. So they're related. Uh, but uh, then we see in, in Luke 1 uh, that John just has this special recognition of Jesus because of his role in announcing uh, the coming of the Lord. Luke 1, verse 41. When G Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, so this is before Jesus is born and before John is born, the baby, that's John, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. So right then we see there's something unique about John that gives him a unique understanding of who Jesus is before everybody else really grasps it. John knows this is the king. He knows this is the Lord. This is the one. Hence he says in Matthew 3 verse 14, how can I baptise you? I need to be baptised by you. You're greater than me. You have the authority. How can I baptise you? But Jesus says, let it be so now. Verse 15. Let it be so now. He says, it's right for me to be baptised. It's right for me to identify that I belong to the kingdom of heaven. But 
But there are some things that we're going to see in the life of Jesus that are only for that time, only for that period of time. What we learn is that the physical presence of Jesus on earth makes a difference. There's some ways in which it really matters that he was here physically and things change when he's not here physically. We realised last week, things are going to be different after the arrival of the king. There's a period of preparation and then he arrives. So things are going to be different. And now we get to this pivotal point where there's, a, in a sense, a transition. Some kind of transition is taking place. As an illustration, if you think of uh, a caterpillar and a butterfly, you've got the caterpillar at the start, you've got the butterfly at the end, but in between you've got the cocoon. Now what's in the cocoon? Well, it's a caterpillar, kind of, uh, but it's also a butterfly, kind of. Uh, it's a caterpillar, but it's also a, it's a butterfly. It's, it's a transitional period where there's a bit of both going on. And you know, it's got to go through that transition to bring about the butterfly. But that cocoon is not how it's going to stay. It's a period of change. And that's kind of a, a picture of this period now. There's certain things about this time when Jesus is physically present on earth that are unique for that time. Leading up to the time when he ret returned to heaven and the period of, that we're in now where we're waiting for his second return. So there'll be some things that we see happening, perhaps here in the baptism of Jesus, that are going to continue after he returns to heaven, but there's other things that won't. There'll be things that are unique to his baptism. Jesus speaks of this, uh, this difference, for example, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. The disciples of John, John the Baptist, come to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? Why do we go for periods of time without food and drink? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So it's just one example where Jesus says, actually me being here makes a difference and things will change when I'm not here. Now next uh, Sunday, we're going to be looking at the next passage, uh, Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at fasting. Uh, so if you ever wondered about fasting, it's not something you hear about a lot necessarily in churches, uh, then make sure you're here next Sunday because uh, we're going to be looking at fasting and what it means and whether it's something that still continues today. Was that something just for the time when Jesus was physically present? Doesn't seem to be the case there, does it, from what he says? So we're going to look at that uh, a little bit next Sunday as we approach chapter 4. So we look at the baptism of Jesus and we've got to think, is everything that happens here a model for us today? Okay, so the next one we learn that baptism itself is still appropriate for Christians today. Baptism itself is still appropriate. Uh, Jesus comes to John and says uh, that he should be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Verse 15. So he sees his baptism as being an act of obedience to God the Father. This is what God wants him to do. He's identifying himself with this kingdom of heaven. That's true for us today as Christians. When we get baptised, we are identifying ourselves as being citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, when he returns to heaven, gives this instruction to his disciples in Matthew 28. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now as we read that verse, we recognize that we can know a lot about God. We can know a lot about God, but there's always things that we struggle to understand. We can know them as facts, but we might not understand them. We know, for example, that God sees everything. 
at exactly the same time, all around the world, all around the universe, but his attention is never distracted from anything that he sees. So we know he sees everything, but when we try and imagine seeing us here, looking, watching us here, and at the church in Newtown, and at the church in Albania, uh, all at the same time, and his attention not being distracted, and also at the same time looking at every church around the world, our minds just can't grasp it. We know it's true, but we don't understand it. We know that he is everywhere. At every point, every atom, throughout all of creation, he is there. And he's not separated, he's not divided up. And we can understand, we, we know it, we know that's true, but we can't quite grasp what it means, how, how that's possible. Here we see the Trinity, what we call the Trinity, that, that God is one God, but three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's something else that we know, we know the Bible teaches that, but we don't fully understand it. But here we see Jesus says to the disciples, baptize people in the name of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God has put a seal on a, of approval, if you like, on you baptizing people. And then when the, uh, when the apostles uh, start to share the good news of Jesus Christ, in Acts 2 verse 38, the people say, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So not just Gentiles or not just Jews, every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So we find sometimes people who've been baptized by John were baptized again in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The apostles teach that baptism is a sign of that new identity, being in the kingdom of God. And also they teach that with repentance comes the gift of the Holy Spirit. The apostles recognized baptism was appropriate for those who trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That doesn't mean baptism is necessary for us to be saved. The apostles also teach that we're saved by faith, by trusting in Jesus Christ. But the evidence of us embracing Jesus as our King, one of the evidences is that we'll get baptized a sign that we've begun a new life, a new identity. It's a fruit of repentance. But what about the Holy Spirit? Here we read that Jesus, as he's baptized, the Spirit of God descends and comes to rest on him. Do we have to wait until we get baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? In this verse in Acts, is Peter saying, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and as part of repentance, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Or is he saying, when you get baptized, you'll receive the Holy Spirit? Well, we see in the scriptures that people receive the Holy Spirit when they receive Jesus Christ as their King. What happens here is unique to Jesus Christ. Something that happens because of his physical presence on earth and it's the beginning of his ministry. Jesus says to his disciples, when I return to heaven, God will send his spirit. You see, that's part of the transitional period while Jesus is physically present on earth. That's, for example, one reason why when we have communion, we don't believe that the bread and the wine become in any way the physical presence of Jesus. Jesus said the presence of the Spirit is the evidence that he is not physically present. And we understand, so therefore, the bread and the wine is just bread and wine. Powerful symbols, but they don't change. Jesus says, I will send the Spirit when I return to heaven. The Spirit's role is to help us to understand spiritual things, the truth about God, to influence our character, to see fruit of the Spirit in our character, like love and joy and peace and gentleness. To enable us to minister to each other, the Spirit gives us gifts so that we become like a part of a body. 
And as every part of the body has a use and has a purpose, so we find we have a purpose in the church. We have gifts to use. And Christians receive God's Spirit when they put their faith in Christ, when they come into that body, when they come into Christ. There's no period between us becoming a Christian and then waiting, going to church and waiting for us to become useful, and then all of a sudden we get the gifts. We receive God's Spirit and we start to become useful for the body when we come into that body, when we come into Christ and put our faith in him. Paul, for example, says that we are sealed by the Spirit. We get God's stamp of approval, if you like. He says it in Ephesians 1, verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we're sealed from the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. And when are we sealed to? Ephesians 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not upset the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The day when Christ returns and takes us to be with him. So Paul says, when you believe in Jesus Christ, you're sealed with the Spirit. It's a bit like when you apply for a job online. If you apply for a job online, you fill in the massive form, you put all the details in, you explain why they should employ you, you fill it all in, and then there's a send button, isn't there? <coughs> and you move the cursor over the send button, and if you're anything like me, you then sit there, and you just look into the air, and you think, have I done everything? I've filled that in, I've done the details, I've done the information, I've said that. Because you know, when you press that button, it's done, it's sealed, isn't it? It's finished, it's gone, it's sent. And John is saying, uh, well, Paul is saying there, we're sealed with the Spirit. It's done. It's finished. Sealed from the moment you believe to the moment Christ returns. Great, isn't it? There's not a period of time where God the Father knows me as his child, God the Son knows me as his sibling, but God the Spirit thinks of me as a stranger. Okay, there's no period of time when that happens. We come into Christ. We come into the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. What happens here is part of that transitional time where Jesus is physically present prior to him sending out the Spirit. Here, Jesus is being given a seal of approval. The Spirit rests on him and God the Father speaks and he receives a commendation from heaven. God says, verse 17, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We've seen in chapter 1 already that Jesus is the Son of David, the one who receives that promise, brings about the promise of an eternal kingdom, the Son of Abraham, through whom all families on earth would be blessed. And now God says, He's also my Son. Son of David, Son of Abraham. Son of God. In this moment, if you ever wondered, what did Jesus do prior to this point? What did he get up to? What was his life like? At this moment, we discover everything we need to know about the life of Jesus up to this point. He was the well-pleasing Son of God. His life had been lived in perfect obedience to his Father in heaven. He is the beloved son. It's a bit like, it reminded me of what we read about the wise men a few weeks ago. You know, it says, uh, verse 10 of chapter 2, they, when they see the star and they know they're going to find Jesus, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Triple helping of joy. Rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And here, God goes over the top, doesn't he? He doesn't say, this is my son. He says, this is my beloved son. And he doesn't say, I'm pleased. He says, I'm well pleased. He pours out this commendation of approval. Jesus had lived without ever disappointing God. And that's what we need to know if we're going to put our trust in him. 
we need to know, yes, he was the well-pleasing son throughout his life. We all fail God. We hurt others. We harm the world that God made. And we ignore the creator. We ignore the person who made us. We try and go our own way. And that's what the Bible calls sin. Hurting others, harming the world, ignoring God. And sin has affected our relationship with God. It's like the crop tool on your art software. It cuts the picture in half. Sin has cropped our relationship with God. It's cut us off from him. But here we read of one who never failed. Jesus, we're told in the Bible, was without sin. He was tempted just like we are, but he never sinned. He never disappointed his Father in heaven. And if we were reading this whole chapter in one go, we'd probably notice there's a real contrast here between what John says about himself and what God says about Jesus. John has said, verse 11, I'm not the guy who can carry the boots. I'm unworthy. I'm not even at the bottom of the ladder. I'm in the, in the gutter. Now God says something about Jesus. John's already said he's mightier than I. He's that much greater. He's at the top of the ladder. But God now says, yeah, Jesus is at the top of the ladder. If you imagine a ladder that goes into space. You imagine looking at a ladder going into space. And Jesus is somewhere up the top, so far above us, so much greater than us. This immense distance between John and Jesus, not just chalk and cheese, more like dirt and domestos. That's how different, you know, just this immense distance between the gutter and the universe in space, the cosmos, worlds apart. And yet, Jesus died for John. Worlds apart. You might think, I can't see him up there. He's so far above me. How can he see me? He came down into the gutter. Jesus died for John. When he died on the cross, he was being punished for the wrong that John had done. Jesus was without sin. And we need to know that because it means he can carry someone else's sin. He's able to carry the sins of people just like John. On the cross, he dies for people just like John. And what does that mean? It means today, if you're conscious that you're just like John, if you sense, I've sinned, I've ignored God, and I'm not that worthwhile, I've made mistakes, I've not even reached my own standards, let alone God's. I'm in the gutter with John. It means that if Jesus loved John, then he loves you. And if you confess that you're a sinner and ask him to forgive you, he will save you. If you trust your life to him, he will pay the price on the cross that you deserve to pay so you can have new life. On the cross, Jesus is forsaken so you can enter into the kingdom. He comes down that ladder into the gutter so you can be raised up from death to life, from the curbside to the kingdom. If you put your faith in him. How do we then know if we trust him? We trust that he died for us. How do we know that that was enough? Because there's a time when Jesus is given another stamp of approval. And that stamp of approval is the resurrection. When God raises Jesus from the dead, he is saying to the world, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus in our place. It is finished. And in that resurrection, there is a promise for all those who trust in him that one day they will rise too. When you become a Christian, you trust in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You identify with his death and his resurrection 
And that becomes a part of your baptism. Baptism is not simply a way now for us to say, the old life is dead, the new life has begun. It's a way of us to say, when Jesus died, I died in him. And when he rose, I rose in him. In a sense, I died and rose because he did it for me. And that's expressed through baptism. We read in Romans 6, verse 3 to 5. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Through baptism, we're able to express that in Christ Jesus, we have died and been raised to new life. So let's just review what we've looked at. We see here the public ministry of Jesus is about to begin. There's another preparation stage for him to go through. We're going to look at that next Sunday. The physical presence of Jesus makes a difference. We have to be conscious of that as we read through the Gospels and just bear that in mind. We see that baptism is still appropriate for Christians and has a deeper meaning than it did right at that moment in time when John the Baptist was baptizing people. People receive the Holy Spirit when they receive Jesus Christ as their King. And we see Jesus receives this commendation from heaven. A commendation that we might think puts Jesus out of our reach. But actually God is telling us he is the perfect Saviour. We cannot make our way up to him. We cannot work our way up that high. But he comes to us. And the reason he comes to us is not because of the value we have in life, because we're the guy with the clipboard. The reason he comes to us is because he loves us so much. We see in this commendation of Jesus how much he must love us in order to not just notice us, but to die for us so that we can spend time with him forever in heaven. What a wonderful saviour. We're going to... Uh,